Bob Goff is an author, a lawyer, and a philanthropist. In his book, Love Does, he tells an amazing story of how he got to where he is now. He says, I wanted to help people at crisis and home and abroad and make some lasting contribution to the world. So after a misspent undergraduate career, spending more time surfing than anything else, he decided he wanted to be a lawyer. So he took the law school admissions test and failed miserably. Still determined to law school, he sent in his application, quote, to several law schools to give the admissions officers a chuckle and to break the monotony of sizing up real law school candidates. I got lots of mail brimming with lovely politeness that all ended with no. (laughs) But Bob was determined. So a week before classes started, he showed up at the dean's office of the law school he wanted to go to. The dean politely listened to his pleas for admission, but then showed him the door. Bob begged, you have the power to let me in. All you have to do is say to me, go get your books, and I'd be a student in your law school. The dean gave me a half grin, indicating he thought it was a cute idea, but that wasn't going to happen. Bob was certain that God wanted him to be a lawyer so he could help people. For the week before classes, He sat on a bench outside the dean's office all day, every day. Every time the dean walked by, Bob would say, Sir, all you have to do is tell me to go buy my books. And every time the dean passed, he ignored Bob. Classes started. On day five, after classes had already begun, Goff writes, My hope was starting to crater as I dragged myself to my perch. Late in the afternoon, without a lot of fanfare, the dean turned the corner from his office as usual. I prepared to say, just let me go buy my books. But something was different this time. Because instead of avoiding me and walking away without saying anything, the dean just stood there towering over me. There was a long pause. He looked me squarely in the eyes, gave me a wink, and said four words that changed my life forever. Go buy your books. Bob Goff goes on to become a very successful lawyer, a law professor, an author, and a very generous philanthropist. We love those go-buy-your-books kind of stories. Frankly, they make great sermon illustrations. Maybe you know similar stories of how, thanks to persistence and tenacity, God did amazing things. Maybe you've experienced that kind of miracle in your own life. Praise God. It seems like the perfect illustration for our scripture reading today. One day, we read in Luke 18, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. He goes on to say, There was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Jesus adds, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. This is a story about a woman in real trouble. First of all, she is a widow. And in ancient Israel, being a widow was a guarantee of poverty. Because you couldn't work. You depended upon your extended family for some grace and mercy. But basically, you ended up just eking out a bare survival living. She was suffering from some kind of miscarriage of justice as well. Perhaps the meager inheritance she thought she'd get from her dead husband was being taken by someone else. Perhaps the little bit of property she owned was being stolen from her. Or perhaps the modest allowance that the community was supposed to provide her with under the Old Testament law, that was being withheld. We don't know. But for whatever reason, she is suffering desperately. The judge is a wretch himself, but he finally gives justice. 
And Jesus' point, of course, is that God is so much better to us, his people, than this unjust judge was to that woman. That's all great. So if we just persist in prayer, those kind of Bob Goff miracles will be ours, right? Well, I have a problem with this parable. Because personally, I've struggled with chronic pain, as you know, for over 25 years. I've prayed, I've faithfully and tenaciously, not for two weeks, but for 25 years. Others have prayed. They've anointed me with oil. They've claimed healing. They've blamed me because I don't have enough faith. What do I do with that when God doesn't heal quickly? At a pastoral level, in my 20 plus years at our church, I've done over 110 funerals. That's 110 families who have all prayed persistently, faithfully, for the healing of their loved one, and it didn't happen. What do we do with that? Right now, people we know are facing serious health crises. They, their friends and their families, are praying persistently and faithfully. Not only is there no good news, but sometimes the news only seems to get worse. I know people who've put in literally dozens of job applications over the past 11 months, and they haven't even got an interview. They've prayed persistently and faithfully. I know people who are desperately lonely and others dealing with mental health issues. They're praying faithfully and persistently, but nothing seems to change. Right now, in places like the Middle East, North Africa, China, Indonesia, and India, faithful followers of Jesus are being persecuted for their faith. And no, I don't mean just being asked to wear a mask when you go into a store. I mean really persecuted, life-threatening persecution for their faith. They pray persistently and faithfully for justice, and it's not happening. They are suffering for their faith. They are dying for their faith. What's with that? For some of us, at times, those great Bob Goff-type miracles ring a bit hollow. They're true enough, but they're just not true in our experience. The problem is, when we only tell those stories, or we tell those stories as the norm in Christian life, then we set up the expectation that this is how God always works, the way he has to work in every circumstance. But what happens when no no dean says, go buy your books? When no healing happens? When no job offer comes after two weeks, two months, or two years? What happens when God does not grant justice quickly to those struggling for their faith, dying for their faith, in countries like Libya and Syria and Iraq? How do we understand this parable in the real world? It's too easy to just tell a one in a million story like Bob Goff's amazing story of getting into law school and say, there, just sit on a bench outside an office for 12 days and God will provide for you. We feel inspired. We feel good until it doesn't work for us. Then what happens to our faith? Look at the final verse in this reading, in Luke 18, 1 to 8. There's a final statement Jesus makes as he concludes a story that we often overlook. Did you notice it? This is what it says. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Or when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Yes, this is a parable about how we should pray persistently and faithfully. But bottom line, it's a parable about faith. It's about our relationship with Jesus on the journey of life, the whole journey of life, not just one short part of it. The widow does get justice. That's good news. But notice, she is still a widow. She's still going to live in poverty. She's still going to have to depend upon God with faith, moment by moment, day by day, for her daily bread. Yes, one of her problems is solved. 
But her life isn't suddenly a bed of roses. She's not suddenly wealthy and healthy and everything going smoothly for her. She still has to have faith. And it's still going to be a long, hard haul. Let's look at real life experience Jesus' disciples had in another part of scripture, in Mark chapter 4. Jesus says to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. He's talking about the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is inviting them on a journey with himself to get to know him better, to bring good news to other people on the far side of the lake. That's great. So they get in a boat with Jesus and they start out. And everything is fine. It's a beautiful day for a sail. But soon a fierce storm comes up. High waves break over the boat. It begins to fill with water, and Jesus is asleep in the stern of the boat. The disciples wake him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? This is a a metaphor for the real life in which we live our lives. Any given day, any given month, any given year can start off calm and pleasant. Just like, remember January 2020? It kind of started off calm and pleasant. But unexpectedly, things go sideways. Storms can come out of nowhere. Suddenly, it feels like our boat is filling with water and we're going under. I find that as as COVID drags on, as I deal with crises in my own life, my own family, as I speak with people in our church and in the community, many of us feel like these disciples. It was pretty good. We were just having a nice sail on a sunny afternoon, and all of a sudden, everything went crazy. The storms came, and we find ourselves struggling. We pray, Lord, help! Don't you care that I'm going under? There's good news in this parable, or in this story, however. Jesus is with his disciples on that lake. He's in the boat with them. The bad news? He's asleep. The good news for us? Jesus promises us that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. We're never alone. The bad news? Sometimes for us too, it feels like Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. We pray, we cry out to him, and sometimes it feels like our prayers just get blown away by the storm. We wonder if God really hears us. We wonder if Jesus really cares. Because he doesn't rush to our aid. We pray. We pray. We pray some more. And the storm still rages. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus does rebuke the wind and says to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stops and there's a great calm. Wouldn't that be nice? Then he asks his disciples an interesting question. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? On the one hand, this seems like an inappropriate question when you're in a tiny boat in the middle of a storm and the waves are crashing over and the water is filling up the boat. On the other hand, it is the question to ask ourselves in the storm of life. Why are we so afraid? What is it about my situation that is causing me such fear? Often the why question we ask is, why is God doing this to me? Or why doesn't God make things right, right now? The better question may be the one that Jesus asks his disciples. Why am I so afraid? That's a real issue. Think about the disciple situation. Really... The safest place they could be in a storm is in a boat on a lake with Jesus. Jesus is with them. (laughs) There's other boats following after, we read in Scripture. Think about the terror they had, because they're in the same storm, but they don't have Jesus. Think about the people on the shore. They're being battered by the rain and the wind and everything else too, but they don't have Jesus. These disciples, even though they're going through a terrible storm, have the privilege of having the one 
who is the master of the waves and the sea, with them in the boat. They are not alone. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Jesus asks. They need to learn that even in the storms of life, they need to have faith in him. They need to trust him. It's one thing to say you believe in Jesus. It's one thing to say you accept him as your savior and desire to follow him as your Lord. It's another thing when the wind is howling and the waves are crashing over the gunnels to actually have faith in Jesus, to actually put your trust in Jesus. Again, this is where simply telling one, one in a million isolated story about a 12-day miraculous answer to prayer isn't good enough. Think about the widow. Yes, her injustice was made right. Her one problem was solved. But she's still a widow. And in ancient Israel, that's still a tough place to be. Every moment, every day, she's going to have to trust in God for her support and for her sustenance. Moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, she's still going to have to trust in Jesus. For over 25 years, I've been dealing with chronic pain, moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Yes, through doctors, God has provided a bit of relief, but the pain is still there. And I still need that daily faith to depend upon Jesus. The people I know dealing with cancer, looking for a job, coping with the loss of loved ones, they may be blessed with good doctors and friends and supports too, but it's still a hard journey. Life is still difficult. But Jesus is really with them through the heartache and the suffering for the long haul. I cannot begin to imagine how those who are facing real persecution for their faith find the courage, find the strength, find the hope, and the encouragement to keep on keeping on. But God is with them. Jesus is with them for the long haul. What I do know from my personal struggles are these things. Jesus is with me. In Psalm 121, we read these words. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over his people neither slumbers nor sleeps. God isn't asleep in the back of the boat. He is with us every moment of every day, helping us through. He gets us through the storms of life. No, he doesn't always calm the storm. He does, however, give us practical help. He gives us comfort. He gives us peace. He gives us hope. He gives us strength to endure. Step by step, he provides a way forward. I'm learning faith. James writes, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Through the hard times, I'm learning to trust Jesus more, to have faith in God more. I have no choice. It's the only way I can go forward. While I would love to be healed, I know my pain is keeping me humbly dependent on God, and that's a good thing. Were I to be miraculously cured this instant, my temptation would be to say, oh, life is great, and I just forget about God. Pain is the spiritual guide I love to hate, but it does draw me closer to Jesus. Jesus asks, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Because of our faith in Jesus, we have hope. Chances are he may not give us a 12-day, two-week, one-in-a-million miracle. He may, but chances are that won't be our experience. Like the widow, we need faith for the long haul. He will get us through the storms, even if he doesn't miraculously calm the seas. In English, 
The word hope is kind of abstract. It's sort of one of those words we really don't know quite how to define. But in Hebrew, the word hope is much more tangible. It's from the same root word as the word for rope or cord or thread. In Hebrew thought, hope is something you can actually grasp onto with your hands. It's not something vague and intangible. Hope in God is something real enough that we can cling to it and it holds us. You can imagine holding on to God, holding on to that solid rope for dear life. Beth Moore writes, Every one of us is hanging on to something or someone for security. If it's someone or something other than God alone, you're hanging on by a thread, the wrong thread. Jesus is asking us to think about what rope, what cord, what thread we're holding on to for dear life. Is our hope really in Jesus? Do we genuinely have faith in Jesus? Are we holding on to him for dear life? Anything else is just hanging on by a thread, the wrong thread. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can have hope, that tangible, holding on to a strong rope kind of hope in God, in Jesus. We pray that your spirit would fill us with that kind of hope. As we go through challenging times, through the storms of life, we pray that we would know that we are safe in your hands and that as we hold on to you, Nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Jesus. Lord, be our strength. Be our guide. Be our comfort. Be our peace. Be our joy. Be our hope. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.